Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. J.J. Abrams. but uh, it's so beautiful to, to see all of you and to be back in a theater. I'd like to introduce someone who uh, you're really excited about seeing. Ladies and gentlemen, the director of a movie called Quiet Place 2, Mr. John Krasinski. Yes! Everybody! Woo! A standing ovation. That's the respect I deserve. <laughs> I can't even joke about that. My mom will be so Ladies and gentlemen, J.J. Abrams. John Krasinski in the house. That's it, that's all we wanted to say. Thanks right. so much. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask you some questions. I have a few questions here, and then we'll take some questions from anyone who has a question. Is it bad that I'm nervous? That you're nervous? Yeah. You're, the movie's done. Oh, God, that's perfect. Great. Um, I'm no longer nervous. I think that you have made uh, like a masterwork here. Like, Whoa. it is, man, it is such a brilliant Whoa. movie. Whoa. Um, and I, I just. I'd love to hear, just selfishly, you talk about every shot. This movie was supposed to come out over a year ago. Yes, it was gonna come out last March, and we had our premiere and everything. It was a lovely premiere, guys. Wish you were there. And then, uh, I think it was two days before we were supposed to come out, we, uh, we all made the decision to not do that. And the truth is, as emotional as I thought it would be, you know, it, it was a bizarre set of circumstances for us, but most certainly the world was going through a much more bizarre circumstance. So it just felt emotionless because it was just the right thing to do. It was just black and white, the right thing to do, and that really helped. It's so good. D I'm just curious, given that you had a year and a bit, did you do anything to it? Because a lot of times you're like, movies gonna come out, and you're like, oh, I wish they Oh yeah, in March, this was animated, guys. It was like a cartoon <laughs> for the kids. Um, no, you know, we had the Dolby mix left. Um, after the premiere, yep. so that was really fun. I mean, we knew that the movie wasn't gonna come out, but I still got to do a Dolby mix before everything shut down, and you know, it's just the most exciting thing when you're doing these theater mixes, you can actually make the creatures go all the way around, and then this time, we were so excited, we got overexcited, I feel like we had too much time on our hands, and we were like, the creature will go all the way around and scare that guy! Like, we could really <laughs> focus it, which was great. It, it, it's, it is an amazing uh, exercise in, in tension, uh, the, the comedy in it is really beautiful, the, the behavior, the comedy, the, the characters. Where did you find your lead actress, seriously? Well, listen, it was a worldwide search. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I how, said, yeah. only British actresses that do American <laughs> accents. That's all I want to see. No, I'm telling you, the, the, the performances, the kids were unbelievable. Uh, Emily obviously always is amazing. Um, I'm, just, I'm just curious what your inspiration was, and it felt to me like, given how you did these amazing, this is so hard to do, terrifying scenes in broad daylight, outdoors. It felt like a Hitchcock kind of a thing, but you know, for, for modern day, what was your inspiration for this? I mean, pretty much exactly that. I, I hadn't seen a whole lot of horror movies before I decided to direct the first one, which was super smart on my part. And then if you see my iTunes library now, you'd be like, is he going through something? Is he having a dark period in his life? Because that's a lot of dark stuff. So I saw pretty much every horror movie I could get my hands on, but the things that I focused on uh, as a filmmaker were the classics. So it was Jaws, it was Aliens, it was Rosemary's Baby, and as much Hitchcock as I could get my hands on. Um, and then visually, I wanted to tell a Western. I wanted it to be a Western, I always did both these movies. And so I was watching, I really wanted it to feel like a modern Western, so it was There Will Be Blood and No Country for Old Men. Wow, and in, in terms of, I, I, I don't wanna talk about it, I mean, I know we've seen it, and I don't wanna ruin it for anyone who might be watching this, so, but, are, are there scenes or sequences that you can at least talk about a little bit that are the things that you're either most excited about for people to see or most proud of? Well, certainly the whole opening of the movie, which again, I think in the trailers you can see that we, we do give you a little taste of the first day that everything happened. And what the key was is I, I wasn't going to do a sequel for sequel's sake. I had no interest in doing that. It was all about um, 
I had to make this an organic story. And as corny as it sounds, every time I was writing, every page I was writing, I thought, is this good enough to warrant the generosity that we were given from the audience on the first movie? And that's, that's just how I felt the whole time. And so the first thing I wrote was the opening, and the opening I thought, not only do I want you all to learn something with these characters, but I want you to do it literally right next to them. And so we shot it very specifically to feel like you were in the moment, that you were in this um, horrible uh, incident with them. And so it was, you know, a huge inspiration was uh, Children of Men. I remember watching Children of Men for the first time and watching Clive Owen come out of that cafe. And when it exploded, I had a visceral reaction, not just yay movie moment. I was like, I was just in that cafe. You almost blew me up, forget Clive Owen. And I thought that's what you have to bring to this. And so my favorite sequence in that is certainly Emily being in the car. And so Emily's shot is all one shot. We got this incredible camera from Germany called this Mokos, it's a robotic arm. And I was telling JJ backstage, one of my favorite parts of the shot. So everything that's happening to her is actually happening in real life. Those are people rolling over her hood. Those are cars bobbing and weaving in front of her. And that is definitely a bus coming at her at 40 miles an hour. I'm not quite sure she knew that last part until she got in the car. Because I said to her, do you want to rehearse one? And she said, no, I just want to feel it organically. And as I shut the door, one of my, cam one of my camera crew goes, and she knows the whole route. And I was like, yeah. And then I thought, did I just put my marriage on the line? This is like a big, it's a big deal. So that's probably the thing I'm most excited about. But at the end of the shot, nerdy, exciting thing, the, when they reversed the car as hard as they did, the camera went off track and then just slowly drifted. And it could have drifted anywhere. And instead, you know how people say like, man, the camera loves that actress. Well, this camera loved Emily Blunt because it just slowly pushes in on her face in the most beautiful close-up. I, I couldn't have done it that well, and the camera's like, I got this. Unplanned. Unplanned. That's amazing. Uh -huh. um, the thing that I thought was so incredible, I, I don't think this is a spoiler for anyone uh, who might be seeing this, but what I loved is that it wasn't just uh, amazing effects and incredible spectacle and visuals, though certainly there is that, but you got some of the greatest drama out of uh, that furnace door. Like, there's you know the arm, you know the, again, not spoiling anything, but the arm that goes down and hits the towel, and you just know that it's not gonna always do that. And I'm just curious where that came from. Is this one of those great things that you just are just waiting for it to go wrong? I love that you love that. The, so my dad grew up in Pittsburgh. He worked in a steel mill and his dad worked in a steel mill. And so I knew Pittsburgh very intimately and certainly the steel industry around there got hit pretty hard. And so I wanted to set this major part of the uh, story as an ode to my dad and, and his dad. And so we, I knew we were gonna go to steel mills and I remember weirdly walking through and seeing the steel mill and thinking underneath are all these furnaces and that would actually be the safest place if you could go a story underneath the ground. And so I had the furnace idea, I knew I was gonna write that and then I thought, but how do you make it scary? Like once they're safe, they're safe. And I thought, oh my God, what if the door locked? And so as soon as the door is unlocked and keeps hitting the towel. I, I thought of the towel as just the, it would be so cool to have Killian Murphy just keep using a towel that you're like, come on man, let's get the towel. And then you know it's really a towel. <laughs> you're a sick bastard. Um, we have some questions. Do you mind if I ask, ask you some questions from uh, You can answer questions Twitter. too, I would love Do you mind it. if I, I already answered these other questions. <laughs> That'd be so disappointing. Um, let's see here, uh, what the hell? Okay, the real rejects ask, was there any pressure to go bigger in the sequel when so much of the first one is about keeping it contained and subtle? I'm not done. How did you handle raising the stakes without dot, 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 raising the volume, question mark? Ooh, very nicely worded question. Um, <laughs> this sequel is much bigger and much scarier, but not by my intention as far as I did not set out to make it bigger or scarier or uh, or um, any of those things. What I did was, all I kept thinking was, how do you organically continue this story? Because I know that the secret sauce is in these characters and in this family. And if you love these people, you are gonna be so terrified to see anything happen to them, whether it's stepping on a nail yeah. or, um, <laughs> or whatever it is. It's, it, it was about these characters. And so once you take away the safety of that ecosystem, the intimacy of that family, that strength that they had, and they have to leave, you quite literally get to the end of the path and then every single step they take from there on out might be their last. So once we got to that part in the movie, it immediately got bigger organically because it's, you're just more worried for this 
family, and then they have to go to new places, and they're going to uncharted places, and places where people have plans for them, and things like that, and so it just started to get bigger organically, and that's when I just listened to the story. I just knew that if we could make this, uh, every set piece that was big, big because you can logically see it that way, then we can go there. So good. Um, again, I, I, I'm very jealous of everyone here because I got to see it in a theater. I was watching it uh, at home and went insane over it and I just kept thinking, this is the kind of movie that you really want to see in a theater. You know, There's a showing in about 25 what? minutes. <laughs> but, but, but full of strangers and screaming together. And yeah, I mean, it, it is the thing that I so deeply miss about this, this last you know, year and a bit. Um, you obviously had a lot of choices about when and how this would finally get released. Uh, I'm just curious why you decided to be out of the gate. Is it for that reason? What was the, what was the thinking? Well, it was partly personal and partly being that. I was a huge fan. I, I mean, for me, this is where my imagination is born. This is where a lot of what I never thought was possible was possible, thanks to filmmakers like Steven Spielberg and J.J. Abrams and things like that. I mean, this is where your dreams really come true. And so then when you go home, you can have a new perspective on your life. And so I knew that this had to be, we built it for the theater experience, it had to be a theater experience. And I give huge credit to Paramount for backing me on that. And then it's, yes, huge credit. Paramount. And um, then it was about dates and we were talking about it and I said, for me emotionally, if you are wanting to see this movie, then I want to be the emotional bookend for you. We were the movie that got pulled just before things stopped being normal, so I wanted to be the first one back to help you bring normal back, and that's what I really wanted. Uh, another short question. Late to the Party asks, uh, besides Kevin, for obvious reasons, who from Dunder Mifflin would survive the longest in your silent post-apocalyptic world? Well, we both have to answer this, because I don't know, I'm sure you know, J.J. Abrams directed The Office. Well, I did an episode. No, please. No, uh, all of them. I did all of them. Uh, no, it's a good question for you. I mean, listen, it's an easy answer, but uh, everyone thinks I'm going to say Dwight, and that's not true. Definitely Creed. Creed would find his way into a rabbit hole and just wait it out that and eat right mung answer. beans and have a good time. That's the right answer. <laughs> Uh, let's take some questions from this spectacular group of human beings yes. who are in this theater right now, all of whom are sitting in these seats. Yes, you, your hand up. Oh, no, yeah. but it, it, you'll be next. Thank you. Yes, sir. Nice projection. Why did you choose to write a horror film? That's a great question. I didn't choose to write a horror film. The first movie was uh, a spec script that I had received and was asked to be uh, an actor in it. And I went, I don't do genre, but thanks anyway. And then I read the script and to me, we had just had, we, my wife had just had our second child. Well done. <laughs> I've been learning. Um, and uh, so our, our, our second daughter was six weeks old when I read the script and I was, fully topped up slash overflowing with all these exact fears and feelings of identity and will I be good enough, will I be there for them, all these huge, huge questions that were overflowing. Certainly not will they be attacked by creatures, but damn close. And uh, so I said to Emily, I, I don't know why, I, I, I feel like this isn't a horror movie, this is a, this is a story about family, this is a story about parenting and what you would do for your kids and keeping them safe. And if I do that, if I actually tell a family drama and Trojan horse it as a genre, you might actually interact with it in a whole different way. That was the idea of the first movie. And then, uh, <clears throat> like I said, the second movie, I, I actually told Paramount that I didn't want to do it. I said, I, I don't know if I could ever have something be as personal as the first movie was. I know it sounds crazy, but it is a love letter to my kids. They're gonna have therapy to figure that out, but <laughs> I'll be able to explain it. And I just didn't think I could ever do something like that. And again, the, the response was so massive, I didn't want to go near disappointing people. And then the only idea I kept having in my head was if Millie could be the lead of this franchise, then we really have something. Not only is she beyond an excellent actor, probably one of the best I'll ever work with. So I knew she could handle it. It was more about, oh my God, she can continue these themes and these metaphors of the first movie. She is a shadow of her father, she's holding up the mantle of her father and actually executing things that he never even would have been brave enough to do and therefore allows this whole conversation of 
you know, the youth in the world are always the most brave and always the most courageous and therefore making the most change. Wow. Damn. Let's see you do that. Uh, well, well done. I, I didn't, wasn't even listening, but it was good. Um, yeah. The, whoever almost went last time. Change my perception of uh, deafness or the deaf community. This is a real answer. I never saw myself as working with a deaf actress. I only saw myself working with one of the most talented people I'd ever been around. That's the truth. There's something, yeah, it's very true. Um, it was non negotiable to cast someone who's actually deaf because not only for the genuine nature of the performance and it would be so much more organic and we'd get so much more magic, but I needed a guide. I needed someone to actually walk me through this script, walk me through these sets, and make sure that I was getting the full perspective and not just being driven by my movie of what would be cool in the movie, but actually what would be organic to her. And um, <clears throat> I will say that, that everybody always asks me about the sound, which is amazing, but the story for sure, my favorite story about sound design ever was uh, born from a conversation I had with Millie's mom. And I said to Millie's mom one day, I said, so can Millie hear anything? Is she completely deaf? And she said, no, she's not completely deaf. She actually has this envelope of sound and it's a low level rumble and she can kind of hear certain things. She probably can't hear your lips talking to her now, but she could probably hear a loud car door behind her or something like that. So I, I went back to my sound team and I was so excited. I was like, we have to do that. What she just described is so beautiful. We have to make sure that we engage in a really real organic way in how she experiences the world. So we did that, it took a long time to do it. And it was, it was Fantastic, and so at that fateful screening in South by Southwest, which is definitely the pinnacle of my career to have somebody, the group of people react like that. Uh, I went to the after party and Millie's mom came up to me and she was weeping and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that you're, you're happy with the movie. And she said, no, I have to tell you that my entire life I've always tried to understand the experience of my daughter and I never could. And uh, for the first time in my life, you just did it. You just uh, showed me what my daughter goes through every day. So she's like, this is so much more than a movie to me. So that, that's the, that to me is the best story of the whole two, two movies. Wow. That's lovely. Uh, another question. I saw a hand over there somewhere. But... You want to hear it? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. <laughs> Using medicine, I was a visual effects on the phone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> very, very nice, very nice. No, 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 keep going. Don't stop his compliments, man. They're very good. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Can we do it after the Q&A? Can we keep asking questions? Awesome. But thank you so much. That's incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
been a gift that we're parting in. And you don't. I know. Uh, <laughs> a QA and gift giving. Uh, yes, you. He's pitching part three, ladies and gentlemen. That's really uh, good. Like, does anybody have a notepad? Um, I, uh, I absolutely can. I think that the ending of this movie, the first movie I did not see in the, uh, doing a sequel, I, I wouldn't be pretentious enough to be like, yeah, there's a sequel coming, right? I mean, come on, look at me. Um, I was very terrified, so uh, once the movie came out and did well, I didn't assume there would be a sequel. On this one, certainly I've had conversations with the studio about the world and how excited I am about the world. The thing I love most about this sort of franchise is, um, most franchises you have a hero and a villain, and on the next part you have to invent a whole new world. Where are they? They're doing a new thing, they're, doing, they're going to a new place. We have the world that you can drop whatever hero and villain you want into the world, which is really fun. So. Yes, the end of the movie was purposeful that there would be, hopefully, a continuation. The, my bosses are right there. If you want to pitch them hard, we can get this going now. Um, no, but the truth is we have a third installment coming, and I have to say I'm so honored to say, uh, thank you very much. Um, one of the greatest filmmakers working, I think, right now is a man named Jeff Nichols, and he is going to write and direct and take this place to a new a new area, and if you haven't seen Jeff's movies, go out and watch them all tonight. And then he'll thank me, he'll be like, what happened on iTunes, like all my movies? Uh, yeah. I'll take one more uh, uh, Twitter question here. Uh, Dwayne and Jazz asks. That's you, come on, no, let's be honest. That. The last one is your Twitter Dwayne and Jazz. Uh, has this movie ever made you think about if this situation were to happen in real life, would you handle it the same way your character did, or would you prepare differently? I wouldn't make it, and I know that because my wife told me. I think I would be asking too many questions. I'd be like, they kill us if we make any sense? <laughs> Just like, immediately. She's like, oh, God. Um, but yeah, I, it's funny. One of my favorite texts throughout this whole thing was from Maya Rudolph, who is, I think, uh, actually not of this earth. She's so special. And she texted me, and she goes, all right, I get it, enough. When are the creatures coming? <laughs> she texted me during the whole pandemic. She was like, I get it. Just let me know when the creatures are coming. Give me the heads up. Um, were there any, just, just one more sort of technical question about, like, in terms of visual effects, there are so many in here. And a lot of them, the, you know, the creatures are obviously uh, there. But are there any, like, invisible effect that you personally love that no one would necessarily know was a visual effect because it's not as obvious? There's. Um, the train sequence, which you can see, is uh, a visual effect when she looks outside the train, which I love. That was an actual painting uh, that they, you know, again, I, I know this gentleman here loves a man named Steven Spielberg as much as I do, and I always loved how they would paint actual paintings for the backgrounds that of some of their shots. Yeah, that painting. So uh, I believe E.T. is a big one that that valley of, uh, after everybody's searching for the alien, the, the shot of the valley is actually just a painting on a, sort of a clear uh, image, and so I did that kind of thing for the train. Was it actually a glass painting, or was it a digital painting? No, it was a digital painting. But actually, uh, uh, speaking of Stephen, one of my favorite, if you're talking about like an Easter egg kind of thing, one of my favorite Easter eggs is in the opening shot when I walk through the town, there's a pizzeria. That pizzeria also sponsors the Little League team that Noah's playing on, and that pizzeria is Brody's Pizzeria. <laughs> for Chief Brody. Nice, nice. Yeah. Beautiful. Let's take one last question uh, from, uh, Right here. Oh, thanks, Xavier. Uh, <laughs> you obviously know each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, as someone who's aspiring to make films myself one day, um, I have a dream project I want to make where I'd like to star in it and it take place over the course of a year. How does what is the process like of starring and directing yourself in a movie? This person wants to star in and direct a movie. What is the process, John Krasinski? <laughs> Call that robot. And <laughs> um, I, I have a weird thing because I started as an actor first, and so I take great comfort in writing and directing, which, as I'm saying it now, sounds very pretentious. Um, 
The reason why is when you're in the movie you're directing, you're with the actors, and so it almost feels more like a play. And so without sounding too heady, when certain actors like everyone in this movie it starts doing what they're doing, you can actually feel it's almost like something's rising off the floor and it's kind of conjuring itself. And the last thing you want to do is go, cut, and then it all falls to the ground and you come out and you go, can you just tilt your head a little more that way? That's great for actors, they love that. Um, <laughs> so being in the scene with them allows me to give a note very quietly. And so, for instance, when I was working with my wife, I'd give her a tiny note and she'd do it right there in the moment. And so the magic was always around us. And so it almost felt more like we were doing theater and that we couldn't cut. And so you'd keep going and, and it feels really, really, um, special when you do that. And then the other thing, to be really honest, is logistics, as he knows, is, for instance, in the first movie, when I go up to the um, silo and I'm lighting the fires, um, we had, I think, seven and a half minutes to shoot that shot before the sun went down. And in that seven and a half minutes, just looking for an actor, I'd lose it. So as soon as, <laughs> as, soon as they were like, you have seven and a half minutes, I just went, <laughs> and started crawling up the silo, and I already knew the note I wanted. I knew which camera we were using, and so I got up there and was able to shoot it in seven and a half minutes, but it would be hard to, to sort of grab an actor, give him a note and all that while the sun's going down. Um, Good luck with your movie, by the way. Where did you um, get the socks? They're excellent. Oh, the, the socks are on full display, I know. Yeah, I'm, no, they're I'm, fantastic. My long legs are just sort they're, of they're, just... They're, 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 no, I'm a fan. Well, it's Ilaria Urbanani, my stylist, who basically took me out of the world of sweatpants for a very long time, yeah. and she's got six sock games. Well on. done. I will say this. Um, it is incredibly hard to do what you made look effortless. Wow. Uh, and you, you've made a movie that, uh, yes, it's a horror movie, but you, it shouldn't be categorized like that. I think it is uh, a, a movie about family and... Uh, about being tested and like the great, you know, films that we all love that inspired you, the films by Spielberg and Hitchcock and and many others. Uh, you've taken something and and you've you've done kind of the impossible, especially given that it is it is a sequel, which I would argue is is a better film even than the first, which I loved. I think you've you've made a movie that that is uh, that just touches the sort of primal place in us and for audiences who are used to so much um, and has seen, have seen so much, you've really done something that is remarkable and you made it look so easy. So I commend you and congratulate you and uh, to anyone who is watching who's not seen it, Quiet Place Part Two, ladies and gentlemen. Just a nice Thank you so much. Thank you so much.